Hey everyone, uh, we're now on section 5, the distribution of a linear combination. You may be watching this after watching the video on section 2, uh, which was uh, covering expectations uh, in the uh, multivariate setting, or the bivariate setting more specifically. Uh, and um, my own opinion is that section 5 of DeVore's book actually should be placed after section 2 rather than section four. So I'm often introducing section five after section two because it at least makes the other following conversations run more smoothly. Um, if, I mean, if you disagree with me, you are of course welcome to watch it after section four, but be aware that my discussions on section three and four will actually be somewhat predicated on this discussion. Anyway, this is not, not a long section. In fact, the other two sections aren't very long either, so let's get started. Um, we're going to assume that we have a collection of n random variables, and I'm not really going to say much about them. I will say that they have expected values, and they have uh, variances and covariances. Uh, so I will say that much and nothing more. Well, if I say more, I will let you know when. So we have some collection of random variables. Uh, we have some uh, constants, a1 to an. The random variable y is a linear combination of the random variables x1 to xn. If y is of the following form, we say that y is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n a i uh, x i. So basically, y is formed by adding up the other random variables in a certain way. Uh, the ai part is just to allow us to maybe multiply by 1 over n or some other uh, weighting system. Uh, but all you're really doing is just adding up random variables in a sense. Suppose that the expected value of xi is equal to mu i and the variance of xi is equal to sigma i squared. The following facts are true in general. The expected value of y will be um, the sum from i equals 1 uh, to n uh, a i times the expected value of x i. And since I've said that the expected value of x i is mu i, we could also write this as a sum from i equals 1 uh, to n um, a i mu i. Okay, now let's compute the variance of y. The variance of y is going to be a double sum, in fact. So we'll sum from i equals 1 uh, to n and j equals 1 to n. We have a i, a j, and then the covariance of x i and x j. Okay, uh, so that's nice, but um, actually that variance formula is, you might not like it. It's, it's true, it's always true, when these random variables have covariances. That said, it's often not the one that we want to use. Instead, we want to say, suppose that, um, uh, so y1 to, no, 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 not y1, x1 uh, to dot dot dot, uh, that this collection of random variables x1 to xn consists of uncorrelated random variables. And this will be the case, uh, for instance, uh, if, uh, if uh, x1 to xn are independent. So if you have independent random variables, this will be satisfied. But in general, you can say uncorrelated, and that's also fine. Um, so independent. If that's the case, the uh, let, let's uh, examine that sum for the variance that I wrote above. Uh, the only terms that will actually matter to the covariance will be uh, when i is equal to j. Because whenever i does not equal to j, the covariance of xi and xj will equal zero. 
you can almost think of this sum here or this double sum as being a sum over a grid if you want or a square that has n cells by n cells and the only non-zero cells will be the cells on the diagonal which corresponds which corresponds to i being equal to j so if that's the case uh, then we can ignore everything else and we're only going to have with uh, the sum when i is equal to j everything else is equal to zero and the resulting sum will be uh, the sum from i equals 1 to n um, a i squared uh, and then we have the variance of x i which is the covariance of x i and x i um, which if you prefer this will be the sum from i equals 1 to n a i squared sigma i squared okay all right so uh what i've actually written down is a very important property about expectations they are linear operators to use linear algebra language which for what it's worth if you are thinking of going into graduate school uh there are two subjects that i think you should master and be extremely comfortable with to succeed calculus and linear algebra and if you forced me to pick between linear algebra and calculus like let's suppose you were to ask me who's likely to do better the student who mastered linear algebra or the student who mastered calculus i would probably say the student who mastered linear algebra is going to do better linear algebra is one of those subjects that appears everywhere in mathematics it is everywhere and i can't not i can't help but feel as if a lot of what i do uh studying theoretical statistics is use what is essentially linear algebra results to get useful results linear algebra is extremely useful so if you're thinking of graduate school i would strongly recommend getting extremely comfortable and if not mastering linear algebra and calculus because calculus is one of those essential things it's going to be used all the time but yeah both of those subjects are used all the time so please master them anyway uh the variance is not a linear operator it is a sublinear operator but the covariance is a bilinear operator so it's linear in both of its arguments um and we've already seen uh formulas for uh for this so um uh so uh our first corollary uh suppose that x1 and x2 are two independent random variables uh, we get the following automatically the expected value of x1 plus x2 uh, is equal to mu1 plus mu2 direct application of that um, earlier result the variance of x1 plus x2 is equal to sigma1 squared plus sigma2 squared uh, you can see now maybe why uh, probabilists and statisticians prefer to specify the normal distribution using the variance it's because the variance of the sum of two uh random variables when they're independent is going to be the sum of their variances um i'll actually revisit that in a second uh let's now talk about the expected value of x1 minus x2 uh, that's going to be mu1 minus mu2 and the variance of x1 minus x2 is equal to sigma1 squared plus sigma2 squared in other words it's exactly the same as if you added the two random variables which is kind of a funny idea it's a, it's a little strange that x1 plus x2 and x1 minus x2 has the same variance but it's not that strange when you really think about it okay um moving on uh uh, and of course the what, what i wrote down here for this corollary you could instead of saying uh these are independent you could say they're uncorrelated and actually it would be exactly the same formula uh so for the next thing suppose that x1 and x2 are normal random variables okay for the normal case where they're bivariate normal actually i should probably uh insert independent So suppose they're two independent normal random variables. 
then a times x1 plus b times x2, this is going to follow a normal distribution with mean a1 mu1 plus b1, no, uh, no, a mu1, <coughs> so not a1 because there's no second a. Uh, so a mu1 plus b mu2, and then uh, the standard deviation, okay, come on. All right, there we go. Ugh, that is the ugliest two I've ever seen. My screen is not being cooperative. Okay. Ugh. Okay, fine. I guess I'll just have to move. Okay, mu2. There we go. Finally. Okay, so we got a mu1 plus b mu2. And then the standard deviation will be the square root of a squared b... Uh, no, of a squared sigma1 squared. Uh, come on. Okay. A squared sigma1 squared plus b squared sigma2 squared. You can probably see now even more clearly why it's preferred to specify a normal distribution in terms of its variance because it just feels like trying to write things in terms of the standard deviation is just making more work than if you just wrote it in terms of, var of the variance. Okay, uh, corollary two, a linear combination of two of normal random variables um, also follows a normal distribution. So yeah, this is, so basically when you add normal random variables, you get a normal random variable in the end, which is really nice. So the sum of normal random variables are other normal random variables. Okay. Uh, example one, suppose x1 to xn are IID random variables. Compute the expected value of variance and standard deviation of x bar, which is 1 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n of xi. Basically, with this one, we're going to use that above formula that I came, the first one that I wrote for this section, but uh, we had those constants ai, they're all going to equal 1 over n. So that means that the expected value of the sample mean x bar is going to be uh, 1 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n times the expected value of xi. And I said that the xi are iid, meaning they are independent and identically distributed. Since they are identically distributed, that means they all have the same mean, which means that all of these ex expected values are going to equal mu. So this is going to be, uh, ugh, okay. Um, stupid screen. All right, so this is going to equal one over n times the sum from i equals one to n mu, which is just adding up mu n times, and then you divide by n, so you'll get n over mu, uh, n times mu divided by mu, n, and in the end you're going to get mu, which means that the expected value of the sample mean is the population mean. Hmm. Okay. Uh, now let's compute uh, the variance of the sample mean. The variance is going to be, uh, this time, uh, remember that the formula for the variance was uh, the sum from i equals 1 to n. These are independent random variables. So we only have to worry about, um, we don't have to worry about all sorts of covariances. We get to say it's ai uh, squared um, sigma i squared, but then we remember that ai was one over n. So this will be one over n squared, which is actually a constant. So you could instead bring that out in front of the sum. So we'll say that this is the sum, um, and uh, we've got 1 over n squared, and we're summing from i equals 1 to n. And then sigma i squared, these are identically distributed random variables, so it's just sigma squared. There is one sigma. Okay, so you're now adding up a constant, sigma squared, n times. So this will be n times sigma squared divided by n squared. And we have one n on the top and two n's on the bottom in, 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 in the factorization. So we get sigma squared over n. Which of course implies that the standard deviation of x bar is equal to 
sigma divided by the square root of n, since you just take the square root of the variance. So what that tells you is that if you were to study this variance, you, what you realize is that this variance is going to zero. Same with the standard deviation. The standard deviation is going to zero as you increase the sample size. So that means that you can make your variance um, arbitrarily small by increasing your sample size. It says that as you increase the sample size, the variance of the sample mean is going to zero or getting really small. The variance of the sample's mean is smaller than the variance of the data itself, which is what you would hope would happen because the objective of the sample mean is to estimate the population mean. So hopefully by increasing your sample size, your sample mean is uh, closer and closer to the truth because it feels like if you collect more data, you should have a better sense of what the population mean should be. And that is in fact what is the case. Okay. Uh, the next example. Suppose x1 to xn are iid random variables. Compute the expected value of variance and standard deviation of just the sum of those random variables. There are several random variables where we know the distribution of sums of those random variables. Um, below is a summary. Uh, but actually first uh okay hold on um before i move on to that i should compute this was kind of weirdly worded um that's unfortunate uh okay anyway i want to compute the expected value variance and standard deviation of t so the expected value of t um yeah these are actually two parts i don't know why there isn't space separating example 10 and then that that segment but this is the example so, um, right, let's write this. So you, the expected value of t is going to be, according to our initial earlier formula, the sum from i equals 1 to n, uh, the expected value of xi. These are iid, so this is equal to mu. So you're just adding up mu n times so that you'll get n times mu. The variance of t is going to be just the sum of the variances um, of your random variables. But those are all the same too because we have iid random variables. Uh, the independence is the reason why we were writing down just the variance rather than a sum of covariances. Uh, so these are all sigma squared. So this is going to be n times sigma squared. And that means the standard deviation of t is going to equal the square root of n times sigma. This is an interesting fact. Uh, let's assume for a second that the mean was equal to zero, in which case the expected value of t would just be zero regardless of what the sample size was. Uh, the variance would still be growing by n times sigma squared, but the standard deviation is growing by the square root of n. This is an interesting fact. Um, the fact that the standard deviation, which we think of as being the average distance an observation is from its mean, it doesn't grow linearly with the sample size. It grows like the square root of the sample size. And this fact is one of the, th the reasons why probability, um, you, you end up with this fact, um, probably has this very different characteristic. Um, you can actually start defining a calculus for probability. And this fact that the standard deviation or the average distance a point is from its mean grows like the square root of n rather than n means that the calculus that you would invent for probability theory uh, behaves very differently than the, well, not very differently, but differently than usual calculus. Um, there are entire books, in a sense, that are based on the fact that the standard deviation of t is the square root of n times sigma, and that that standard deviation grows like the square root of n rather than n, uh, rather than like n. So, yeah, I think I once had a student where um, I was saying uh, a company is like making 
some revenue every month. And uh, the revenue that they make in a month can be modeled by some random variable. And I wanted to have the students uh, find the distribution of the, or work with the distribution of the revenue over a year. And a student was thinking that, okay, we've got uh, N months, and that's corresponding to a year. Um, they were wanting to check whether their calculations were correct. And they were looking at the units of the standard deviation. And they were like, okay, we've got time times uh, revenue per month. And then we multiply that with the number of months. So um, that would be, so I should be multiplying the standard deviation with the number of months rather than the square root of the number of months. Because I want the units to match to, in order to figure out the standard deviation of um, uh, revenue in a year. And that was wrong because you don't multiply by the number of months. You multiply by the square root of the number of months. This is one of those situations where this, like, this student actually seemed rather upset and betrayed by the fact that he had to multiply by the square root rather than n because he was like, I'm an engineer. I've always been told um, if, if you want to make sure that your calculations are correct, you should look at the units. So why am I multiplying by the square root of months? Because probability theory says so. <laughs> Basically, it's it's he, he thought about it incorrectly, and there I was not about to admit, because I'm right, that you, that um that he should have multiplied by the number of months rather than the square root. I was like, but the, then the units don't match. Well, the the units thing was always a rule of thumb, right? That was always a rule of thumb. That was never a law. So, uh, and probably you had to multiply by the square root of n. And he was basically just thinking about it incorrectly. Um, like his units rule of thumb was, uh, like it's still mostly right. It's just, it doesn't work here. It, it, that was not the right way to think about it. Okay. Um, here's the thing. We're talking about linear combinations of random variables. There are many random variables out there. We know that, and we know the distributions of sums of those random variables. And recognizing random variables as being the sum of other random variables is an extremely useful idea and an, an extremely uh, useful skill, if we could say. So here are some examples of random variables that are the sums of other random variables. Um, we'll say that uh, xi... Uh, follows a Bernoulli distribution with parameter p, then the random variable t, which was defined above as the sum of those random variables um, amongst m of them, that's going to follow a binomial distribution. Uh, uh, why? Oh, jeez. It, it, I, I, I hit the dead spot right on. <laughs> Okay, that was weird. Anyway, um, it's going to follow a binomial distribution with parameters n and p. So t, uh, so a binomial random variable can be interpreted as the sum of n independent and identically distributed Bernoulli random variables. That's one example. Let's see another example. Let's suppose that xi follows a... Mm, let's say uh, let's 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 work with the Poisson case next. It so xi follows a Poisson distribution with parameter mu. Then t also follows a Poisson distribution with parameter n times mu. So you change the mean, but you still ultimately get another Poisson random variable. Okay, uh, which. Another way to think about this, if you really wanted to, is you could instead um, say that xi uh, follows mean uh, mu divided by n, in which case t follows a Poisson distribution with mean mu. That's another way you could think about it. Um, okay, uh, let's say 
that xi um, plus 1 follows a geometric distribution with parameter p. So xi itself is not quite a geometric random variable. But you can think of xi as being very close to 1 because if you add 1, then it will be geometric. Basically, xi, remember that the geometric distribution as I described it is tracking the number of flips until you get heads. xi, if, um, if we have to subtract... If we have to add 1 to xi to get a geometric distribution, then xi counts the number of tails that you got until you get a head. Okay? If this is the case, then t is going to follow a negative binomial distribution uh, with parameters uh, n and p. Okay? Uh, let's suppose that xi uh, follows an exponential distribution with parameter mu, then the sum of those exponential random variables is going to follow a geometric, uh, no, not geometric, um, uh, a gamma distribution. Uh, it will follow gamma distribution with parameters n and mu. Let's suppose that xi follows a normal distribution with parameters mu and sigma. Uh, then that means that t is going to also follow a normal distribution, but with parameters n times mu and parameters square root of n times sigma. So actually, we know the distribution of a number of sums of random variables. And remember that in each one of these cases, xi were iid. But yeah, we end up with all of these relationships, which actually tells us a lot of useful information about uh, these distributions that show up on the right-hand side of this, uh, of this uh, arrow. It tells us that all of those random variables actually start to look like normal random variables. But that is going to be the subject of section four. Um, so I'm just going to leave it here. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that's it. And I will see you later.